I can get this to work. So can everybody see this set of slides? Is that clear to everyone? Yes, okay. So thank you all for um, joining us this morning. Um, I'll be presenting an overview of my current book project, um, Immigration and Apocalypse, as just mentioned, uh, which studies the use of the revelation of John and its literary forebears in American discourses of immigration. So this may seem like an unlikely juxtaposition. What do early Jewish and early Christian apocalypses have to do with immigration policy in the US of, for example, the 1890s or the 1960s? And how could the words of a first century apocalyptic seer be related to the current president's actions against immigrants? I argue that since it's so-called discovery, conceptions of America as an apocalyptic paradise and New Jerusalem have set the stage for accompanying apocalyptic metaphors of sanctimonious inclusion and violent exclusion. So I'll begin with conceptualizations of America and the US as heaven-like and an eschatological destination. So the New Jerusalem as depicted in Revelation. And from there, I'll discuss several consequent aspects of US immigration that continue this apocalyptic metaphor, including the association of undesirable people groups with disease, the use of record keeping at points of entry, and the demands for physical walls and restrictive barriers. And I'll draw examples from the 16th century all the way to the present, working thematically rather than chronologically. So this is uh, what is called an Isidoran or TO map of the world from around the year 1500. This map doesn't obviously convey much geographical information, so its power lies in its symbolic presentation of the world. This map shows an encircling ocean, that's the O, divided by a T made up of rivers. So there's the horizontal line of the Nile and the Don, and the Mediterranean Sea running perpendicularly down to form that T. And these waters separate Asia, Europe, and Africa, and places the city of Jerusalem at the physical, geographical, and theological center of the map. Asia forms the top half of the circle, and with the rising sun here labeled as Anatole at the very highest point of the map. So here's a more detailed map. Um, we can see the very highest point here, um, illustrated with more detail. So this is dating from around 1480. And on this map, we see the walled garden of, uh, the walled garden of Eden with the tree of life or of knowledge at its very center and it's flanked by Adam and Eve. And out of paradise flow four rivers as they're described in Genesis chapter two. And again, at the center lies Jerusalem here with the detail added of Jesus crucified. Um, again, centering the world geographically and theologically. So these maps, of course, are hardly the kind that Christopher Columbus used in navigating the Atlantic. He used their symbolic orientation to understand his personal role and mission throughout his voyages. Columbus sailed with always two destinations in mind, the same two highlighted on these maps, Jerusalem and paradise. It was his belief informed by the apocalypticism of Joachim de Fiore and the Franciscans that the end of the world was rapidly approaching, but also that two prophecies must be fulfilled before the eschaton would arrive. First, Jerusalem must be taken back from the infidels and brought under Christian rule. And second, the Christian gospel must reach all peoples of earth. So the belief in an eschatological restoration of Jerusalem has its foundation in Israelite prophecies, but the Joachimites and Columbus understood these through the revelation of John. And so Christ's millennial reign of Revelation chapter 20 would of course be located in the holy city at the center of the world. So this prophecy went hand in hand with the evangelization of the world, since Revelation 7, 9 describes a holy multitude from every nation, from all tribes and peoples and languages. In Columbus's mind, his voyage across the ocean was inspired by the Holy Spirit so that he could fulfill these very two prophecies. By sailing westward, he could reach rich lands in the east, and consequently, he could bring home the funds for a final crusade to take back Jerusalem. At the same time, the gospel would reach the peoples at the ends of the earth. 
and that he should have conceived of finding lands at all by sailing west, Columbus in fact credits the revelation of John and divine vision. And he writes after his third voyage of the new heaven and earth of which our father spoke through St. John in the apocalypse, he made me messenger and showed me that place. So in Columbus's imagination, the lands he reached in the Caribbean were no less than the apocalyptic lands of Revelation. These he also conflates with the terrestrial paradise, the Garden of Eden, at the easternmost end of the world, at the highest point of these medieval maps, closest to heaven. So via the Revelation of John, Columbus frames his discovery as ultimate and apocalyptic in three ways. One, these lands are the new heaven and earth of Revelation. Two, they are the terrestrial paradise full of riches for a new Jerusalem crusade. And three, they contain the final peoples to convert before the apocalypse. So ultimately, when Columbus envisioned these lands, he saw Jerusalem as the destination and the new Jerusalem beyond that as the final end of his task. Believing himself to be the recipient of God's revelation, Columbus understood himself as a seer and prophet, like those of Jewish and early Christian apocalypses. In Revelation, as well as in books like the Apocalypse of Paul or Second Enoch, the seer, the prophet, ascends, whether in a journey to the heavens or up a mountaintop, in order to receive a vision and secret knowledge. So also, Columbus understood his journey as an ascension, both literally up to Anatole, the most heavenward point of earth, and eschatologically toward the fulfillment of prophecy and toward the ascension of believers to the New Jerusalem. This apocalyptic division of transatlantic voyages, so-called discoveries and evangelization would continue well beyond Columbus's death in 1506. Hernan Cortez would come to be understood as the Moses of the New World, and 12 Franciscan and Dominican friars who arrived in New Spain would become the 12 apostles of Mexico ready to utter, usher in a new and final apostolic age. What the arrival of these men meant to those who watched these immigrants arrive on their shores was devastation and death through disease and warfare and the destruction of their home by the violent reinterpretation and appropriation of it as a terrestrial paradise. By the start of the 17th century, the decimation of native populations combined with social and parochial conflict depressed the end times passion of the Franciscans. But instead, a new millenarian understanding was emerging from native peoples who had adopted the Christian faith and among a new generation of fluid heritage and identities. Occupying a hybrid space, the Peruvian Franciscan friar Gonzalo Tenorio proclaimed an apocalyptic vision that reappropriated revelation for a post-colonial reality, envisioning a native church and nation as the blessed millennial kingdom. In a similar vein, though born of vastly different circumstances, the Puritans also understood themselves to constitute a new elect people and kingdom in the new world. They did not come to America to fund the recapture of Jerusalem. That dream was mostly over. They were instead building a new Jerusalem among themselves. Seeking a second more radical reformation, they envisioned the church flourishing in new lands open up to them. And this apocalyptic church would stand against the works of Satan and the Antichrist whom they identified as the Pope. John Cotton, the most prominent minister of the Massachusetts Bay Colony, envisioned his community as the true church, writing, it would rise again into a church body and the church body so reformed as may bear witness against all anti-Christianism. This is the first resurrection. The faithful communities of New England would work towards the realization of the New Jerusalem as, the, as a final judgment of Revelation 20 drew closer. When Cotton wrote to his friend and minister John Davenport to sail from England to join him, he felt his Puritan mission in part was already realized, writing that the order of the new churches and the commonwealth brought into his mind the new heaven and the new earth wherein dwell righteousness. John Davenport sailed for Massachusetts in 1637, where he joined Cotton in Boston, but it was in New Haven that Davenport would strive to establish the new Jerusalem, working for a congregation that could experience, quote, perfection of light and holiness and love as it is attainable on this side of heaven, end quote. 
In Puritan teaching, this earthly church would progressively be purified until it would manifest the heavenly Jerusalem, which would fully become at Christ's return. It is perhaps the apocalyptic vision of New Haven that inspired Davenport and the city leaders to create a town plan according to a nine square grid centered around the town green. The outline of the entire town would measure what was determined to be 500 cubits by 500 cubits, the measurements of the apocalyptic temple in Ezekiel chapter 42, and as determined by scholars such as Isaac Newton to also be the measurements of um, Solomon's temple. This preoccupation with divine numbers and measurements comes of course from Revelation, um, the Revelation of John and its apocalyptic forebears, wherein angels disclose the cubits of divine structures with numbers of mystical significance. Davenport and his colleagues were not only concerned with the measurements of the nine square grid, but also with the central most important square, the New Haven Green. This space was to be able to hold the bodies of 144,000 saints, the number of the elect in Revelation 7 and 14, so that they would rise from the city's center at the final judgment. In establishing this new Jerusalem on earth, there was no longer the need to recapture the old Jerusalem. This was the new world. They were in New England and New Haven, a setting befitting the new Jerusalem. Alongside cultivating this heaven on earth, the Puritans also attempted to convert the native people groups, the Quinnipiac and Pequot nations, among others. In doing so, they hoped to bring in what Apostle Paul called the full number of the Gentiles, a necessary eschatological event before Israel would finally convert, after which would come the final judgment. Some Puritan thinkers were convinced uh, that the indigenous people were the fabled lost tribes of Israel who were said to have disappeared after the Assyrian conquest. By this calculation, converting these peoples would mean not only reaching peoples at the ends of the earth, but also the conversion of Israel, combining two events of Christian prophecy. In this way, the Puritans were colonizers in two realms. They were literal colonizers of their present, taking over lands and assimilating native peoples, while reinterpreting an entire landscape to match their apocalyptic dreams. At the same time, they were colonizers of the past, reworking the entire book of Revelation so that it no longer resembled a work of the first century, Jewish Christian, the Puritans reclaimed the seven churches of Asia Minor in a book as seven stages of Christian church history, while they appropriated the crises of the early Christians as their own political and church governance struggles. But this colonization was modeled to the Puritans, ironically, by the book of Revelation itself. It and other Christian apocalypses were also colonizing the past by taking Israelite and Jewish history and trauma, indeed the entire genre of apocalyptic, and using them towards supersessionist claims. By claiming Jewish history and apocalyptic as their own, early Christians could attain two things they desperately needed as a new movement, a long and ancient lineage for legitimation and an aesthetic for a vision of its ultimate goal and future. Two things also needed by the colonizers of America and later the leaders of the United States. These apocalyptic writings and interpretations were besides spiritually compelling, politically and socially expedient for both early Christians and the Puritans. The first Puritans of the great migration in 1630, um, the mission of, the, of a new Jerusalem recruited travelers and it kept zeal alive through harsh times and set a stringent moral standard. The Puritan leader John Winthrop in his now famous sermon, A Model of Christian Charity, exhorted his fellow travelers to consider themselves a city upon a hill with all the eyes of people upon them. Though the scripture quotation comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the city alluded to is no doubt Jerusalem, both in the Matthean context and in Winthrop's. And this equation of America with the new Jerusalem and a holy paradise would continue as an expedient metaphor and belief to the present day. John F. Kennedy invoked the city on a hill in 1961 as president elect, likening the country's mission and challenge to that of the Puritans arriving in Massachusetts. But no political leader used this metaphor more than Ronald Reagan. Ronald Reagan, 
use the phrase city on a hill or actually shining city on a hill over 20 times in political speeches, more than any other president. He also used it the most famously in his farewell speech in January of 1989. Now let me read a short quotation from this speech. Let me see if it shows it. I've spoken of the shining city all my political life, but I don't know if I ever quite communicated what I saw when I said it. But in my mind, it was a tall, proud city built on rocks stronger than oceans, wind swept, God blessed, and teeming with people of all kinds living in harmony and peace. A city with free ports that hummed with commerce and creativity. And if there had to be city walls, the walls had doors and the doors were open to anyone with the will and the heart to get here. That's how I saw it and see it still. Reagan sounds like an apocalyptic seer. He has a vision, he sees um, this shining city. And Reagan absolutely understands the city on a hill, the US as an apocalyptic utopia, plucking imagery directly from Revelation 21, which describes the New Jerusalem on firm foundations, filled with people, bringing tribute and wealth with walls, but with gates that remain open. These are exactly defining features of the new Jerusalem in Revelation. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. It has the glory of God and a radiance like a very rare jewel, like jasper clear as crystal. It has a great high wall with 12 gates and the walls of the city has 12 foundations and on them are the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the lamb. The nations will walk by its light and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. Its gates will never be shut by day and there will be no night there. People will bring into it the glory and the honor of the nations. Here we find the model for Reagan's vision. The seer John of Patmos beholds the vision, a shining city built on strong foundations, uh, filled with people from everywhere, buzzing with commerce and wealth. And there's a wall and the, there are gates, but these gates are never shut. Reagan continues this speech to describe the US as the new Jerusalem. He writes, after 200 years, two centuries, she still stands strong and true on the granite ridge and her glow has held steady no matter what storm. And she's still a beacon, still a magnet for all who must have freedom, for all the pilgrims from all the lost places who are hurtling through the darkness toward home. Reagan is retreading Puritan ground, claiming the US as both a beacon and a haven for the saints who are pilgrims from all the lost places, a phrase that alludes to the Puritans, um, the implied Christian saintliness of the imagined travelers and the designation of other countries as lost places. These travelers are also hurtling through the darkness in an apocalyptic otherworldly dimension. Reagan thus transforms an immigrant vision of America as the New Jerusalem into one that serves those inhabiting the US. This US as New Jerusalem is no longer a destination, but a home and a home of an established populace with a wealthy economy and a defining boundary, a boundary that must be careful to denote hospitality, hence we have open doors, but also to have the mechanisms of exclusion to activate doors and gates that can be closed for the protection of the city. This transformation or inversion of the New Jerusalem vision shows the protean nature of apocalyptic, a genre that encourages allegory with incomprehensible imagery, numerology and archetypal figures. For the Puritan immigrants of the 17th century, the book of Revelation provided legitimacy for their mission by embedding their actions in prophecy and providing a divine narrative to justify their colonization of lands and peoples. But after the establishment of immigrants in the 18th century and the formation of the United States, the prophecy would then be used to justify white nativism by creating principles of belonging and exclusion. Apocalyptic metaphors and images from Revelation are most pronounced in immigration discourse when nativist fears reach their heights. This is an illustration that ran in Harper's Weekly in 1898 at the peak of anti-Chinese sentiment among white Americans. The artist is German and the illustration first circulated in Europe, but it is here tellingly reused in an American publication. 
The perspective of the white American is aligned with that of the white European nations presented here as gods and warriors in a mix of nationalist and Greco-Roman symbols. Leading them is the Archangel Michael portrayed with typical iconography with wings, Romanesque armor and a flaming sword. In Revelation 12, the angel Michael leads a heavenly army in battle against the great dragon, Satan. Here he shows the warriors a new enemy, the yellow peril of the east, represented by a flaming Buddha looming over burning villages. The yellow peril is understood not only as the threat of China and other eight nations, but as the horde of Chinese immigrants encroaching upon American land. In 1882, the US passed the Chinese Exclusion Act barring Chinese laborers from entry into the country. The act was to expire in 10 years. And as the deadline for renewing the act in 1892 approached, newspaper headlines stoked fears that the Chinese would once again flood the population. This Oregon newspaper describes the threat in apocalyptic terms, playing with the designation of China as the celestial kingdom, Tian Chao, and the slur of celestial to refer to Chinese peoples. Under the title, A Celestial Horde, it reads, the woods are full of Chinese over in Canada. It is said the denizens of the flowery kingdom in large number are dodging behind trees and hiding in sequestered nooks, ready to make a break for the United States the minute the clock strikes 12 on the night of the third. The Chinese imagined to lurk just beyond the border are described as an evil angelic host of another realm, ready to descend literally from Canada to invade at the stroke of midnight on doomsday. The Chinese Exclusion Act uh, was renewed in 1892 and then made permanent in 1902. Until it was repealed in 1943, all Chinese immigrants were denied entry unless they were a temporary visitor or the family of a US resident. In order to process immigrants that arrived at San Francisco Bay and to prevent their escape, the government opened a detention center on Angel Island in the Bay in 1910. Even in the opening of what would amount to be a prison and interrogation center, this point of contact was described in terms of hospitality and with an allusion to Columbus and his visions. The San Francisco Chronicle boasted that when the immigrants arrive at Angel Island, the quote, newcomers from foreign shores will probably think they have struck paradise. Added to this are the heavenly place names of the Bay Area, Angel Island or formerly Isla de los Angeles, and the Golden Gate Strait, which is now spanned by the bridge, first named Chrysopoli, uh, Greek for Golden Gate, that recalls the ancient Golden Gate of Constantinople, built by Theodosius, and before that, the Golden Gate of Jerusalem, derived from the early Christian work, the infancy gospel of James. John Fremont, the man um, who, gave, who christened the strait, also envisioned it as a gate through which would pass the wealth of the Orient, perhaps like the wealth of the nations entering the new Jerusalem. Of course, the wealth of the Orient could also call to mind Revelation 18, where merchants and ships with cargo of gold and jewels once enriched the city of Babylon. This demonstrates the ambiguity of apocalyptic symbols where gold and jewels and pearls can both adorn the new Jerusalem or the whore of Babylon. So too, Angel Island, a veritable paradise, could, from the perspective of the Chinese immigrants, be understood as the mythical island of immortals of Chinese fables, or a hell populated by devils, so-called guaylo in Cantonese and guizhi in Mandarin. This is the sentiment expressed in one of the poems carved in the walls of the men's barracks of Angel Island. Uh, not the one depicted here, but poem 23 states, this place is called an island of immortals, when in fact, this mountain wilderness is a prison. So although San Francisco was Jingsan or Gold Mountain, in Chinese imagination, and even now it's called Zhou Jingsan, Old Gold Mountain, uh, this shining city could also be a symbol of exclusion. Another barracks carving reads, the gold and silver of America attracts. I search for glory. Not only are my 1000 pieces of gold depleted, but my countenance falls. And yet another states, the Western buildings are lofty, but I have not the luck to live in them. How was anyone to know that my dwelling place would be a prison? What the Chinese immigrants found on Angel Island were not open doors, free ports and inclusion in the New Jerusalem. 
Instead, they found themselves herded into segregated quarters, men from women, Europeans from so-called Orientals. They're subjected to humiliating physical examinations because they and other Asians were understood to carry more infectious diseases than other races. Above all, they are subject to hours of interrogation in order to process their identity and claims for the right to enter into the country. Every Chinese detainee had to stand trial and was guilty until proven innocent. And each case was investigated and analyzed, files and paper trails sifted. The average case took two to three weeks to process before judgment was pronounced, but some lasted months upon months. One woman was detained for 20 months before all legal options were exhausted and she was deported back to China. Those who successfully gained entry had usually been subjected to interrogations lasting day after day. One 12 year old boy whose case was taken up to the federal courts endured hearings that generated 87 pages of testimony. This stands in sharp contrast to the promise of paradise, the open doors for those with the will and the heart to enter. This did not signal, however, that America had failed as the new Jerusalem, but rather that the metaphor continued and continues today to serve the political interests of those using it in immigration discourse, first as immigrants, then as nativists. Rhetoric emphasizing the United States as the heavenly city shrinks a vast nation into a unified compact space traditionally and historically bounded by walls. This does several things at once. It creates the impression of crowdedness and scarcity and it foregrounds boundary as defining identity, which makes belonging an either or enterprise and creates the danger of infiltration and invasion. It is no mistake that spacious skies and amber waves of grain are invoked to celebrate America's beauty, but immigration discourse and of minoritized peoples deals mostly with cities and urban settings. This unified and bounded space marks absolute inclusion and exclusion and are the foremost features of the New Jerusalem in Revelation. Inside the city, there is one throne, one river around which gather all the saints with the Lamb's name written on their foreheads, all wearing white robes. And identity within is uniform, even if the inhabitants had once come from every nation, people, and language. Outside the seer states in Revelation, that are the dogs, the sorcerers, and the fornicators, and murderers, and idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. Inside are those healed and cleansed, but the seer says, nothing unclean will enter it. The city, the New Jerusalem, is in fact a bounded quarantine space. Sin, plague, and filth must stay outside the city walls. In fact, Revelation 22, 14 states that entry depends on cleanliness. It says, blessed are those who wash their robes so that they may enter the city by the gates. Those who have washed and are clean are the righteous and the citizens of that city belonging inside the gates. As for those outside, an angel in that same chapter pronounces them hopeless saying, let the evil doer still do evil and the filthy still be filthy. So cleanliness is literally next to godliness and symbolic of righteousness. Those who practice evil stay outside as the filthy, as those quarantined and uh, if they survived at all. In fact, earlier in chapter 16, those who had worshiped the evil beast and bore his mark also bore the plague, a foul and painful sore that came from the wrath of God poured out from a bowl onto the earth. This literally marks these idolaters as unclean and unfit for entry into the city. The bounded city must be kept, uh, must keep plague and dirt outside its barriers. And by this same logic, those unwanted in America as the New Jerusalem are labeled filthy and diseased. Their disease threatens those inside the walls and their very sickness demonstrates their immorality and their depravity. Here, the specters of malaria, smallpox, and leprosy loom over the city of San Francisco, with leprosy literally pouring as from a bowl of God's wrath, disease upon Chinatown. And leprosy is identified as a Chinese coolie with a braid. And near the center, bravely stands the tower of a church threatened by these plagues. Here, the Chinese are a plague, 
Uh, they're a swarm of locusts, much like the locusts of Revelation chapter nine, sent on the earth to devour and whose quote, faces were like human faces. And behind them looms the demonic figure of famine overtaking the land. The Chinese immigrants understood as absolutely foreign and undesirable was this marked as diseased and hopelessly depraved. The New York Daily Tribune in 1854 described Chinese peoples as quote, unclean, filthy beyond all conception so that the Chinese quarter of the city of San Francisco is a byword for filth and sin. We're reminded of this kind of vitriol today in racist remarks and acts against Chinese people and the coronavirus because Chinese are still understood as perpetually foreign, unassimilable immigrants and therefore the bearers of disease. Unwanted immigrants from Europe also found themselves blamed for epidemics and labeled unclean. During the mid 19th century, Irish fleeing starvation came to constitute nearly half the population coming to the US. Their poverty was pronounced by nativists as evidence of their mental and moral inferiority. Worse still, the Irish were accused of spreading cholera, which in the minds of Protestant Americans was linked with Irish Catholicism. Cholera among the Irish was claimed by one New York City preacher as divinely sent upon the Irish for their Catholicism, a scourge, a rod in the hand of God, like a plague poured out from the bowl of God's wrath. Cholera was also linked with other unwanted immigrants arriving in New York City. Here we see the Grim Reaper, the figure of death, arriving by ship in caricatured Turkish dress, and his belt reads cholera. And on the shore, the New York Board of Health aim a bottle of carbolic acid at the ship fighting disease and their carriers as they would invaders in battle with a front line of soldiers and a row of cannons. Other diseases were linked with other undesirable people groups um, deemed unassimilable. Those forced into slavery from Africa had long been labeled unclean with so-called Negro diseases. And during the great migration north African-Americans were blamed for venereal diseases. New York City officials blamed Eastern European Jews for the spread of tuberculosis, the so-called white plague, at the end of the 19th century. And immigrant Jews from Eastern Europe were taken off incoming ships and also from their homes in the city if they had settled and were taken to quarantine islands. Thus when understood as a secure and bounded city with a unified, uniform so-called native population, the United States must then defend against the infiltration of disease, filth, and plague. In this metaphor and in nativist minds, unwanted populations were those that threatened through difference. And difference becomes equivalent to disease and plague. Here on the left-hand side, we see the undesirable peoples of Europe as rats being piped by Uncle Sam toward New York as at the great joy of the Europeans ridding their nation of plague and pest. On the right-hand side, we see a pest poison advertisement to rid homes of rats and bugs. And in the center is the caricatured Chinaman about to eat a rat, so disgusting an identity that he is both a pest that must go and a filthy eater of them guilty of the worst aberrations. You might notice that the rats in the left-hand cartoon have labels, although they are hard to read. These rats with caricatured faces and hats representing Jews, Roma, and others are labeled thief, assassin, bandit, convict, degenerate, murderer, and so on. And some carry a paper depicting the black hand, a sign of a crime syndicate originating in Italy. And thus this plague of pests also demonstrates the close association and equation of disease filth and sin. And one way to keep them out was by quarantine and segregation that treated sickness foremost. The other was through interrogation and records which foreground sin and criminality. Attempted entry into a city can be met with three primary checks. One, outright violence as in battle. Two, quarantine and physical inspection against disease. And three, bureaucracy. Record keeping and demands of records form another part of the apocalyptic New Jerusalem metaphor. Revelation chapter 20 contains what I call the most bureaucratic scene of the New Testament, the scene in which the dead are judged. Verses 11 through 15 read, Then I saw a great white throne and the one who sat on it. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. 
Also, another book was opened, the book of life, and the dead were judged according to their works as recorded in the books. And the sea gave up the dead that were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them. And all were judged according to what they had done. And anyone whose name was not found written in the book of life was thrown into the lake of fire. These books, the records of deeds and the book of life, continue a theme of Jewish apocalyptic literature, where a book of life or book of deeds must be consulted as the dead seek to enter paradise. In the Testament of Abraham for the first and second century CE, one recension notes a giant man who continuously writes down all the peoples, uh, the deeds of all the peoples, and two angels bear two books containing these records to the judge. In the second century Christian text, The Shepherd of Hermas, a book of deeds determines a person's fate, and Hermas asks whether sins can be forgiven or names added to the book of life. The scene in Revelation is one of crowds and waiting, of poring over records, of illogical conclusions, and ultimately fear and violence. Everyone who has ever lived appears before the throne, and each person's deeds has been recorded and must be looked up, so the books are opened, it says. But after all this, one more book is consulted, the Book of Life. And it turns out this is the only one that matters, despite all the records in all the books. If anyone's name does not appear into the fire they go, the Lamb's Book of Life serves as a heavenly citizenship list wherein a name either appears or not. This apocalyptic scene bears an uncanny resemblance to immigration and naturalization procedures in the US, where interminable waits turn into onerous paperwork followed often by denial of citizenship based on what seems to be the capricious whims of those in power, and then those barred from entry must face violent destruction. In US immigration history, records were not kept at the beginning, except to record the numbers arriving. Only in 1795 did the federal government pass the naturalization law in reaction to growing numbers of those perceived as other Irish and European immigrants not coming from England. Thus, those now established in the New Jerusalem began to turn their attention to policing its boundaries and to protect the ideal identity of its citizenry with uniformity as desirable. In order to grow the population, naturalization had to take a form other than only by birth. So the first US requirements for naturalization were based on the then novel principle that citizenship could come from the confession of allegiance rather than birth. As in a religious conversion, a person could be born again as a citizen and have their name recorded in the American Book of Life. At the same time, deeds, that is financial and criminal records had to be consulted and the growth of such records began in earnest in the 20th century. Records could be expunged and sins forgiven, but in an echo of the illogic of revelation, records of deeds are trumped by a pre-existing belonging or exclusion from a mystical book of life. That is to say, regardless of paperwork and records, ultimately what rules entry into the United States, particularly in this present moment of time, is an already formed exclusionary understanding of who belongs in the citizenry, a population idealized as unified and uniform, white and pure. Finally, to enforce the exclusion of unwanted peoples and to police the security of the New Jerusalem, physical walls must surround the city. Revelation's description of the city focuses most on the physical wall of the city, its beauty and its strength symbolized by the precious materials used in their construction. These walls, as in other Jewish apocalyptic texts, evoke the memory of the earthly Jerusalem, its first destruction, rebuilding, and second destruction by foreign powers. The vision of the heavenly city establishes its strength and inviolability through its detailed description. During the growth of the American empire, boundaries were necessarily flexible for the sake of conquest, namely of Mexico, and barriers were porous. Once the border stabilized, these barriers hardened metaphorically to the point of manifesting physically as literal walls. The same rhetoric of exclusion noted before of disease and criminality now appears in US immigration discourse in exhortations to building a border. This envisions the US again as a unity, as a city unit around which can go a wall. As ridiculous as encircling a 3 million square mile country can be, this project demonstrates that the metaphor of New Jerusalem still holds power. 
the beauty and strength of the heavenly wall of the New Jerusalem symbolizes the power of a city completely secure with complete control over entry, heavenly immigration. In the political battle over the US-Mexico wall, President Trump and his proponents use the same discourse of wall symbolism, echoing details given in Revelation about a beautiful wall that is clear or ridiculously see-through and also exhibiting the same symbolic focus on large numerical measurements as a sign of political power. Tied to this discourse is the repeated designation of those kept out as beasts, rapists, and murderers. In conclusion, the apocalyptic New Jerusalem has served explorers, colonizers, and nativists of America in interpreting their own identities as new arrivals to paradise and the identities of later immigrants, whether desirable or not, according to how the vision is manipulated. By casting the United States as a city, immigration discourse also brought in notions of scarcity, insecurity, and vulnerability against which must be raised protection by quarantine, record keeping, and physical barriers. At the same time, imagining the US as the new Jerusalem also evokes the old Jerusalem, the center of the world. This is the perspective of America first rhetoric that both centers the US and idealizes its population as uniformly white and allied. The enemies of Jerusalem in long Christian tradition are the infidels. So also America as new Jerusalem is depicted as under threat by Muslim peoples. Revelation has led many lives of in, in history of interpretation, itself once excluded from the Christian canon. For many scholars, it has been an embarrassing text that leads to fanatic millenarianism and doomsday hoarders. For others, its anti-Roman, anti-empire sentiments inspires political action and revolution. In the history of America and the United States, its use in Amer immigration rhetoric has been at times inspiring and expedient, offering a vision of refuge, healing, and hope. But with the New Jerusalem comes exclusion from it and the violence and terror outside the city walls. Thank you for listening. Well, that was a tour de force and uh, <laughs> you should definitely write a book on this. <laughs> I'm trying. Yeah. <laughs> When do you think it will be ready? I mean, this is uh, gripping, I think. Thank you. Um, so I have two chapters done um, and I'm working on a couple of grants. Um, I, next year will be sabbatical, I hope. So hopefully um, I'll get most of it done um, to be ready for publication in another couple of years. So we'll see. It's great, great Thank stuff, you. great material. Um, we have just one question so far, if others post them in and I've written about 10 questions of my own. Um, one person has asked, does the phrase manifest destiny have its roots in scripture or elsewhere? I don't think the term itself um, comes from any scriptural quotation, but I think the concept behind it, along with American exceptionalism, that kind of idea is definitely, I think, scriptural and apocalyptic in the way that it's constructed. Um, to think that, um, you know, the idea of destiny or fate itself, I mean, it, it's got kind of theological, not even necessarily Christian um, contours to it, but then um, in the American context, definitely arising from this kind of um, apocalyptic kind of thinking. Mm -hmm. Now, how about the rapture? Um, I don't know if you're gonna focus on that at all in your book, but that's a fairly rel recent uh, formulation of faith, isn't it? it? Dates back to somewhere around the 1850s, but the whole left behind series yeah. that was a blockbuster, you know, millions and millions of books being sold. Um, what do you make of that? To me, it, it's it's bogus theology. Um, but what, what what would you say about it? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not going to deal. That's a really interesting question because it gets um, placed with all of the prophecy in the New Testament, but it comes from. Second Thessalonians, so not um, within the Apocalypse of John, although it's placed within that timeline, right? So it's become part of it, like you said, through the Left Behind series and others like that. Um, I mean, I think it's it's been a powerful evangelical um, kind of scare tactic for conversion in in many instances. And you see, you know, movies like Thief in the Night from the 1970s and um, others that that it's it's to turn up the dial on fear. Um, 
in terms of thinking about apocalypse. I mean, I think apocalyptic is always kind of scary, but rapture added to that adds a, another layer of um, exclusion that is, is you know, supposed to take you by surprise and so be even scarier. So I think that that's the major role that it's been playing in, um, in the circles that it's prominent in. Seems to me one of the biggest dangers of it is this idea of the notion, what is the nature of God? So throughout the Old Testament, you have this sense of God is love. But the rapture gives you this sense that um, if you don't keep your life in order, good luck. You're on your own. Uh, it, the opening scene, I believe, is in an airplane and uh, the passengers are flying along and all of a sudden, like, you know, one third of them disappear, including the pilot. So uh, those were the good guys. The bad guys who, you know, committed adultery or cheated on their taxes or um, didn't do enough to care for the poor uh, or didn't vote for the right politicians, they're left behind. <laughs> and yeah. No pilot. So what does that say? <laughs> the plane's going to crash. Right. How does that play into a loving God? <laughs> so does yeah. that theology, does the, do parts of the New Testament actually work against each other? In terms I, of think, yeah. I mean, I think for sure. And this is one thing I've struggled a lot with with my students. We um, I had a seminar course on Revelation this semester. And, um, you know, like I said, at the end of the talk, there are very affirming and redemptive interpretations of Revelation. And I think many people think of it as, you know, depicting refuge and also liberation. It's used a lot in liberation theology because it is anti-empire, anti-Roman empire specifically in its historical context. So you could see that as affirming, you know, God's love in, um, in throwing down what is oppressive. So that that is there squarely in Revelation at the same time it replicates a lot of the power structure you see in empire by recreating a throne and a throne room and violent destruction. So it's very ambiguous and um, it's hard to, to, to reconcile some of that with a loving God. Um, and it would it'd be interesting to imagine what would a loving apocalypse be? You know, um, I don't think we ever think of the the word apocalypse or apocalyptic in loving terms or in gentle, compassionate terms, that would be mind blowing to think if it could be reinterpreted in that way, right? Where it doesn't include violence and it doesn't include exclusion, you know, all of those things. Um, that would be uh, something imaginative that I would like to see. Yes, the gentle apocalypse. <laughs> <laughs> Just enjoy. Where you're you're uh, gently nudged into belief rather than like drop from an airplane. <laughs> right, right. So when I was, in seminary and did my clinical pastoral uh, education up at the um, um, Dartmouth Mary Hitchcock Hospital in New Hampshire. And I was uh, farmed out to the White River Junction VA Hospital. And I remember one of the men I went to see in his hospital room one day said to me, um, the book of Revelation is his favorite book. I read it over all the time, which immediately made me nervous. Um, my sense is that it's the most misinterpreted and distorted book of the Bible. Would you concur or do you think there are other books that lend themselves to <laughs> further distortion and misappropriation? I mean, I think that's definitely justifiable. I mean, you could probably say that about m much of the New Testament, but yes, Revelation definitely lends itself to all sorts of interpretation, right? Um, in which you have, you know, people nailing down the end time date over and over again. And so that people are encouraged to sell all the possessions and leave their lives behind in order to, to, to follow some sort of prophecy based on a code. And, you know, taken in its historical context, it's definitely not what Revelation was trying to do. Um, but at the same time, I mean, it's, it's written to be confusing. And I think it lends itself to a myriad of interpretation because it uses bizarre imagery. It's doing it on purpose. Like I think apocalyptic is bizarre in order for the reader to have that kind of experience and also to lend itself to more and more interpretation. It's really fascinating. And I think that's why, you know, it can be um, a really intriguing and attractive read because it does that. I mean, it was my favorite. I remember when I was in church as a young girl and I was bored during sermons and I would read about the New Jerusalem because I thought it was so pretty. Like I just loved all the jewels. Um, so there are different ways to read it. Um, and it is, it lends itself to that. Um, and I think I saw one, 
question pop up about what is what does revelation say about human nature you know and and the and i i i think yeah there is attraction to apocalypse apocalyptic drama i think that's people are naturally drawn to the kind of dramatic stark um stuff that we see in in revelation and we see that also in in movies we see that in you know the things that it's generated in culture pop culture everywhere um there's a definite attraction to it as well this how much do you think of this is to get back to that question that is posted to, um did just to the human spirit the human nature that there have to be bad guys and there have to be unclean people when my younger brother uh spent a year living in china about 35 years ago um at the uh at the university in the new territories the chinese university in the new mm -hmm. territories any female student who dated a a white Caucasian, you know, student was, I believe the term for these students, the, the white students were guilos, uh -huh. you were shunned, you, you know, you, because the whites were, were unclean. They were not part of us. Uh, you were contaminated. Uh, so do you think, do you find some of this in other religions and other cultures, that same kind of reflexive, uh, we need to have someone to be unclean in order for us to feel good about ourselves and safe? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I think there's always how to define the self, right? And is that always, it seems often to be in opposition of another, right? To, to in or to, to stake your claim or to, to feel like there is a sense of justice. Um, and there's always that struggle. And I feel like there is in apocalyptic writing that dramatization of conflict that seems necessary. I mean, even in Aristotle, not Aristotle, um, but in you know ancient philosophers defining an Aristotle of, of what drama is of what story has to be is that it has to contain conflict right that's one of the major principles that writers often refer to or think about right and why why does that have to be the case when it creates that kind of struggle and I wonder if there's something like ontological that because you know we are formed in adaptation <laughs> we need to have conflict right we need to have um, some sort of negative force in order to be ourselves. I mean, that I don't want to go that way, but it's kind of nihilist or uh, horrible to think in that particular way. But there is something that that drives that. I think the other thing that people crave or see or relate to in apocalyptic writing is a sense of conclusion, right? That we can't just go on forever. Like theology, in many ways requires teleology right it requires conclusion because if there is no ending is there never any 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 judgment right is there never any um end what if we continue just now without apocalyptic eschaton is that a possible theology or christian theology i would ask mm -hmm. i i don't know the answer to that but i leave that to you <laughs> and so you you know you alluded to the wall between the united states and mexico and uh, the rhetoric that is used about it, which is rather fascinating. Israel has built up a wall as yeah. well. Um, they don't turn to the book of Revelation as a, a um, scripture for them to work with. But are there other texts that they use to theologically interpret the need for a wall like that? The Nehemiah and rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem? Or, or do you find, have you heard of any use of that by politicians? So I have not paid attention to that political, particular political discourse, but I have to say, I have to imagine that the idea, the very idea of, and here I'm getting into dangerous politics, but the very idea of Israel as it is now in, in relation to Palestinian um, rights is, is in, in fact like a, a sense of destiny and apocalypticism that is rooted in some of the stuff that we see in Hebrew scripture, right? So Ezekiel and the rebuilding of this heavenly fantastic temple, which does have a wall and um, yeah, and Nehemiah, the rebuilding, right? This is the idea of a particular right to those pieces of land and a particular holy theological claim, I think is, I mean, I don't know about the particular wall discourse, it would be interesting to see like as a counterpart, if that's also going on. I don't know that that's a 
political battle I want to pick at. But <laughs> but yeah, I mean, I would I would not be surprised. Right. So one of your biggest fans is Reverend Dr. Cheryl McFadden, who just loves studying with you at the Yale Divinity School, and she notes interesting readings from Revelation are often selected for celebration of life liturgies and the opening words for the uh, burial office in the Episcopal Church are taken right out of the, the book of uh, Revelation. Um, in the midst of uh, death, we, let's see, it's uh, just read these um, yesterday. The opening words is the priest walks down the, um, I always say, I am the resurrection and the life. Uh, uh, as for me, I know my redeemer lives, uh, Job, but, but you, a number of the words are, you know, portions are taken out of Revelation. So how is this book that talks about hell and damnation also lifted up as uh, this is your ultimate hope? Well, I mean, I think in many liturgies, actually, Revelation is not used very often, right, in the cycle. Um, and often, I mean, it's not a book that I think many preachers would say, oh, this is something I really want to preach about. Like it is a difficult text to preach on carefully. Um, and it itself was a very, it was accepted with a lot of ambiguity um, and ambivalence um, in through Christian history. So in the beginning, um, it was left off of certain canons, um, on canon lists, and also um, you know, it didn't ex gain acceptance until later as just part of the New Testament. So it's, it, it, it has been an embarrassment and um, because people have interpreted it in certain ways and it is so full of bizarre things um, that people have approached it in, in a very hesitant, cautious way or just outright rejected it um, in, certain, in certain communities. So um, it does have that past to it. Um, and so, yeah, it's, and, and it often, I think, kind of resisted in terms of liturgy and preaching um, in communities as well. Mm -hmm. And so the passage, and I would recommend this to folks to look at is uh, Revelation 21, two through seven uh, is one of the um, readings that is suggested for the burial offices in the Episcopal Church. Very powerful, rich reading. Uh, because of the uh, translation, it's leans towards a masculine and that uh um you know that the final line is and he shall be my son not so good if you're burying a, a female but um but anyway that's a powerful lesson and uh you know i'll tell you i was standing in the uh, line at uh, cvs to pick up a prescription and i saw they had a rack and it had um Bible books and things on spirituality. And one said, what the Bible tells you about all the key things you need to know in life. And I said, including heaven. So I'm waiting there. I, I open it up. And, and of course, it talks about how heaven is filled with emeralds and rubies and things like that. And uh, very, very interesting book. Yep, yep. Um, how can we reverse the imagery from Revelation as a walled city with limited space for occupants um, in order to, you know, to avoid perpetuating this mentality of scarcity, just not enough room for us. We can't have one more immigrant coming in. Are there ways that we in the church can help reverse this imagery? Yeah, I mean, that that reminds me of, you know, discussing with my students, like what is the imagery that's used in different understandings of America? So, and when you think of America, you know, individualism and pioneer spirit and all that sort of thing and manifest destiny, the images you see are, you know, the kinds you see in a beer commercial, right? You have these giant fields and there's horses and it's the country. That's the kind of imagery we use for that mode of discourse. The mode of discourse when we talk about immigration is the walled city, right? And so like, how do we switch? Like what would happen if we use the kind of imagination of the rolling hills? I mean, America is a giant country. I mean, think about Europe and the way it's populated and compare it to America. The, the fear with which people are talking about immigration is really ridiculous compared to the type of space and opportunity that still exists in America, right? So like if there's a way to reverse and not think about it as the new Jerusalem, right? Because I think it does, that metaphor does drive that city urban metaphor in an unhealthy way. Um, you know, it, it's weird to think of topography in the in the in the book of Revelation, like that. what, where are we really, right? Like it's, you're kind of in a nowhere and the really only place you see are either the land and earth being kind of obliterated or you have this new Jerusalem that's kind of descending on the thing. So 
is there a way to think of a different landscape with which we can talk about? And someone brought up loaves and fishes, right? What if we seed it on the grass, right? There's a different way of thinking about peoples um, than, than boundaries, right? Than limited and, and scarcity and that kind of thing. So I think changing our metaphors, changing the way we, the, the visuals that we, you know, so that's the very subtle messaging that people often don't see as explicit, right? Um, because it's not in text, but there is visual signaling of when we talk about these things that make it significant and, and harmful in particular ways. I found it quite interesting that you pointed out that in Ronald Reagan's um, final uh, address to the American uh, population, that he lifted up a vision of um, the United States as a walled city, but with open gates. Mm -hmm. I, I'm reading uh, the new biography of uh, James Baker, who worked as chief of staff to Ronald Reagan. Mm -hmm. Very interesting book. But so here you have um, uh, an image of the walls, but the gates are open. How have we got into the image now that we need to build even more walls and the gates have to be absolutely shut? Oh, yeah. Any idea how we've gotten there or is that just political or is it is there anything theological that has been shifting to lead us to that? I don't know. I mean, that's a that's a big question. Um, and I mean, the pandemic doesn't help. Right. And the, the ironic thing about the pandemic is that we find doors shut to the United States like we're on the outside. We are not allowed in other places. Is because of what's happening in our city walls. And I think that's the, the irony of the walls is you shut yourself in, but who's inside? Like is, is what's going on inside any good? And is, are people not gonna let you out, right? <laughs> like that's the other fear that people never talk about. If you, you reverse that, the inverse of the fear is that you can't leave. Um, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I do think there is a growing sense of fear against outsiders and a, a brewing nativism and white supremacy absolutely under this current administration that that stokes the closed doors closed borders um, and there's a um, you know a vilifying of, of uh, this the kind of open borders you know no immigration policy that kind of um, extreme caricature of what um, of what healthy immigration might look like that drives this conversation. Um, in a very fearful way um, and direction. Um, I think definitely 9-11 has something uh, to do with also the understanding of the border in a particular way. I mean, also every, every airport is a border in some sense, right? And so what's happened after 9-11 is also, I think, representative of a growing idea of protection that's, that's continuing as well. Mm -hmm. A couple of just final questions. One is, um, I lived in New Haven for three years when I attended the Yale Divinity School, where you are, and I had no idea that it was laid out in a grid based on the book of Revelation. Uh, are there other towns or cities in the United States that you're aware of that mirror that same interpretation of the book of Revelation? You know, not that I know of. And, I, you know, I keep reading that New Haven is the first planned city um, in the in the United in America at the time um, but I don't know there hasn't been much and to be honest I was going to go and look up the records in the New Haven Museum to be able to confirm this because I've only talked to historians who told me about the plan and the green um, so I haven't been able to see the primary documents for myself because of the pandemic but um, I don't know I mean I would I don't know that any other city shares that same kind of plan. I mean, that's, you, that's partially the answer to why the New Haven Town Green is so gigantic compared to the greens of other cities, because um, it had to fit <laughs> 144,000. It's a giant green, um, it, it, disproportionate, I think, to the rest of the grid. So, yeah. That's an amazing story. <laughs> um, so we've all just celebrated Thanksgiving, and you've talked about colonialization. Um, we, we've, our, our story about Thanksgiving is in many ways a myth about how we all got along, broke bread, uh, but then shortly after, within one generation, um, we were exterminating the Indians who had befriended us. Um, are there theological things that underlie that kind of playing out of that story, or do you think it's mostly colonial forces that, or, but, or, but are there, I guess what I'm asking, are there biblical theological underpinnings for that we must dominate? We were given this land. It's our destiny. God wills it for us. 
Yeah, so in um, the chapter that I've worked on on disease, um, the idea that, you know, they saw as they came, the, the Puritans and other colonizers that came, that indigenous people were dying in masses because of disease. And their interpretation of this was that God was clearing the land for better growth. In fact, that's almost a direct quotation. Um, so there's definitely a theological underpinning of the project they saw. Um, you know, there's not... The, the spread of disease was in most cases not intentional, right? But the interpretation of it is incre in, incredibly disturbing. And so that was their idea of, of destiny at that point was um, this land is for us. Um, it is, and it comes from not only Revelation, but also the Exodus metaphor, right? Of a promised land. So all of those things culminate into that kind of interpretation of this new world. Mm -hmm. So I've spent a fair amount of time in the north of uh, Spain, and there I've seen some beautiful illuminated manuscripts there that have uh, really horrific graphic, you know, depictions of of hell and torture, etc. Do you think most of these are written, you know, are rooted in the Book of Revelation, um, or are there other books of the Bible that also lend to that kind of interpretation? Yeah, I would say in maybe in certain stories that Jesus tells in the Gospels. So, for example, um, in the story of Lazarus, um, the poor man Lazarus, um, who uh, is um, given his reward. This is in Luke. Um, and then the rich man whose gate he was at is in uh, in hell, really. And he asked for a drip of water so that those kinds of stories or, um, you know, Matthew 25, in which there is a last judgment and the sheep and the goats are separated. So there are other stories that are very evocative of a hell or a hellscape, maybe not in so much detail, <laughs> but, um, you know, where you don't have, it, in Revelation, it's kind of all been conflated. So you do have this lake of fire, but you have these bulls of God's wrath and plague. So you have kind of like a variety of terrible things you can experience. And that, I think, feeds into the later depictions of hell and torture and, you um, other things you see in Dante and you see in um, illuminations like you described and also other um, apocryphal uh, Christian writings where you have like all sorts of horrible descriptions of what sinful people are subjected to. Um, yeah. So a uh, final question, you've done a brilliant job of helping us to see how we in the United States have used these texts to look at pandemics, plagues and um, immigration. Do you, are you aware of other countries um, that have used the book of Revelation in similar ways within their country. Yeah, so um, it, it, you know, it's it's obviously slightly different in tenor, but for example, in um, in the Black Death, we did have um, the burning and the raising of Jewish communities in Europe um, as being blamed. So Jewish Jewish people is being blamed for poisoning wells, for example, in a in a uh, province in Germany, right? So we do have that association of plague and disease with others. Um, the difference is, though, that America was separated so distantly by geography and, and you know, miles, literally, um, that it's, it, the, the conversation is slightly different. So in, in the years before, right, in the centuries before America and then quote unquote new world, the conversation was about the other that was already there, right? So Jews were already a part of the community, um, maybe not accepted, but they were there. And so it was kind of about expelling what was within. Um, there was kind of a purifying from, you know, flushing out what was within. And that's the conversation you see more in um, the quote unquote old world, right? But the new world presented a fascinating, like stark new beginning. So that kind of other is far more set apart by boundary because you have this giant ocean separating you from Europe. So um, it's this different set of things and it, it makes it for far more dramatic apocalyptic reading because it is separated by such a distance um, as versus what was happening in Europe. So we take the prize. That's right. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> it's a dramatic story, right? Yeah. Well, we'll end on that happy note. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you, Professor Lynn. This has been really riveting. Everyone stayed with us. Uh, to follow you through this and it's gone even longer than your normal zooms and classes so uh, <laughs> That's fine. Thank you. you've enlightened us and i'm sure many more will watch this on demand god right. bless stay thank safe be so well having me you too bye-bye bye, -bye. bye.